I knew my way to the battery pretty straight, for I had been down there on a Sunday with Joe, and Joe, sitting on an old gun, had told me that when I was prentice to him, making my way along here with all dispatch, I had just crossed a ditch which I knew to be very near the battery, and had just scrambled up the mound beyond the ditch, when I saw the man sitting. His back was towards me, and he had his arms folded, and was nodding forward, heavy with sleep. I thought he would be more glad if I came upon him with his breakfast, in that unexpected manner, so I went forward softly and touched him on the shoulder. He instantly jumped up, and it was not the same man, but another man, and yet this man was dressed in coarse grey too, and had a great iron on his leg, and was lame, and all this I saw in a moment, for I had only a moment to see it in. He swore an oath at me, made a hit at me, it was a round weak blow that missed me and almost knocked himself down. It's the young man, I thought, feeling my heart shoot as I identified him. I dare say I should have felt a pain in my liver, too, if I had known where it was. I was soon at the battery after that, and there was the right man, hugging himself and limping to and fro, as if he had never all night left off hugging and limping, waiting for me. He was awfully cold, to be sure. I half expected to see him drop down before my face and die of deadly cold. His eyes looked so awfully hungry, too, that when I handed him the file and he laid it down on the grass, it occurred to me he would have tried to eat it if he had not seen my bundle. He did not turn me upside down this time to get at what I had, but left me right side upwards while I opened the bundle and emptied my pockets. What's in the bottle, boy, said he. Brandy, said I. He was already handing mincemeat down his throat in the most curious manner, more like a man who was putting it away somewhere in a violent hurry than a man who was eating it, but he left off to take He shivered all the while so violently that it was quite as much as he could do to keep the neck of the bottle between his teeth without biting it off. I think you have got the egg, said I. I'm much of your opinion, boy, said he. It's bad about here, I told him. You've been lying out on the meshes, and they were dreadful aguish. Rheumatic, too. I'll eat my breakfast afore they were the death of me, said he. I'd do that, if I was going to be strung up to that there gallows as there is over there, directly afterwards. I'll beat the shivers so far, I'll bet you. He was gobbling mincemeat, meat bone, bread, cheese, and pork pie, all at once some real or fancied sound, some clink upon the river or breathing of beast upon the marsh, now gave him a start, and he said, Suddenly, you were not a deceiving him. You'd be but a fierce young hound indeed, if at your time of life you could help to hunt a wretched warmint hunted as near death and dunhill as this poor wretched warmint is. Something clicked in his throat as if, and he smeared his ragged rough sleeve over his eyes, pitying his desolation and watching him as he gradually settled down upon the pie, I made bold to say, I am glad you enjoy it. Did you speak? I said I was I do. I had often watched a large dog of ours eating his food, and I now noticed a decided similarity between the dog's way of eating and the man's. The man took strong, sharp, sudden bites, just like the dog. He swallowed, or rather snapped up, every mouthful, too soon and too fast. And he looked sideways here and there while he ate, as if he thought there was danger in every direction of... He was altogether too unsettled in his mind over it, to appreciate it comfortably, I thought, or to have anybody to dine with him, without making a chop with his jaws at the visitor. In all of which particulars, he was very like the dog. I am afraid you won't leave any of it for him, said I, timidly. After a silence during which I had hesitated as to the politeness of making the remark, there's no more to be got where that came from. It was the certainty of this fact that impelled me to offer the hint. Leave any for him. Who's him? said my friend, stopping in his crunching of pie crust. The young man that you spoke of, that was hid with you. Oh, uh, he returned with something like a gruff laugh. Him, yes, yes. 
He don't want no whittles. I thought he looked as if he did, said I. The man stopped eating and regarded me with the keenest scrutiny and the greatest surprise. Looked. When, just now, where? Yonder, said I, pointing, over there where I found him nodding asleep, and thought it was you. He held me by the collar and stared at dressed like you, you know, only with a hat, I explained, trembling. And then I was very anxious to put this delicately, and with the same reason for wanting to borrow a file. Didn't you hear the cannon last night? Then there was firing, he said to himself. I wonder you shouldn't have been sure of that, I returned, for we heard it up at home, and that's farther away, and we were shut in besides. Why, see now, said he, when a man's alone on these flats, with a light head and a light stomach, perishing of cold and want, he hears nothing all night but guns firing and voices calling. Hears. He sees the soldiers, with their red coats lighted up by the torches carried afore, closing in round him. Hears his number called. Hears himself challenge. Hears the rattle of the muskets. Hears the orders make ready, present, cover him steady. Men, and is laid hands on. And as to firing, why? I see the mist shake with the cannon. Arter it was broad day, but this man... He had said all the rest, as if he had forgotten my be Not here, exclaimed the man, striking his left cheek mercilessly, with the flat of his hand. Yes, there where is he? He crammed what little food was left into the breast of his grey jacket. Show me the way he went. I'll pull him down, like a bloodhound. Curse this iron on my sore leg. Give us hold of the file. Boy! I indicated in what direction the mist had shrouded the other man, and he looked up at it for an instant. But he was down on the rank wet grass, filing at his iron like a madman, and not minding me or minding his own leg, which had an old chafe upon it and was bloody, but which he had. I was very much afraid of him again, now that he had worked himself into this fierce hurry, and I was likewise very much afraid of keeping away from home any longer. I told him I must go, but he took no notice. So I thought the best thing I could do was to slip off. The last I saw of him, his head was bent over his knee, and he was working hard at his fetter, muttering impatient imprecations at it and at his leg. The last I heard of him, I stopped in the mist to listen, and the file was still going. Chapter If I fully expected to find a constable in the kitchen, waiting to take me up. But not only was there no constable there, but no discovery had yet been made of the robbery. Mrs. Joe was prodigiously busy in getting the house ready for the festivities of the day, and Joe had been put upon the kitchen doorstep to keep him out of the dust pan, an article into which his destiny and where the deuce had you been was Mrs. Joe's Christmas salutation when I and my conscience showed ourselves. I said I had been down to hear the carols. Ah, well, observed Mrs. Joe. You might have done worse. Not a doubt of that, I thought. Perhaps if I warn't a blacksmith's wife, and, what's the same thing, a slave with her apron never off, I should have been to hear the carols, said Mrs. Joe. I'm rather partial to carols myself, and that's the best of reasons for my never hearing any who had ventured into the kitchen after me as the dustpan had retired before us, Joe darted a look at him, and when her eyes were withdrawn, secretly crossed his two forefingers, and exhibited them to me, as our token that Mrs. Joe was in a cross temper. This was so much her normal state, that Joe and I would often, for weeks together, be, as to our fingers, like monumental crusaders as to their legs. We were to have a superb dinner, consisting of a leg of pickled pork and greens, and a pair of roast-stuffed fowls. A handsome mince-pie had been made yesterday morning, which accounted for the mince-meat not being missed, and the pudding was already on the boil. These extensive arrangements occasioned us to be cut off unceremoniously in respect of breakfast. For I ain't, said Mrs. Joe, 
I ain't a going to have no formal cramming and busting and washing up now with what I've got before me, I promise you so. We had our slices served out, as if, in the meantime, Mrs. Joe put clean white curtains up and tacked a new flowered flounce across the wide chimney to replace the old one and uncovered the little state parlor across the passage, which was never Mrs. Joe was a very clean housekeeper, but had an exquisite art of making her cleanliness more uncomfortable and unacceptable than dirt itself. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and some people do the same by their religion. My sister, having so much to do, was going to church vicariously, that is to say, Joe and I were going. In his working clothes, Joe was a well-knit characteristic-looking blacksmith, in his holiday clothes, he was more like a scarecrow in good circumstances than anything else. Nothing that he wore then fitted him or seemed to belong to him, and everything that he wore then grazed him. On the present festive occasion he emerged from his room, when the blither bells were going, the picture of misery in a full suit of Sunday penitentials. As to me, I think my sister must have had some general idea that I was a young offender whom an Akutcher policeman had taken up on my birthday and delivered over to her. I was always treated as if I had insisted on being born in opposition to the dictates of reason, religion, and morality, and against the dissuading arguments of my best friends. Even when I was taken to have a new suit of clothes, the tailor had orders to make them like a kind of reformatory and on no account to let me have the free use of my limbs. Joe and I going to church, therefore, must have been a moving spectacle for compassionate minds. Yet, what I suffered outside was nothing to what I underwent within. The terrors that had assailed me whenever Mrs. Joe had gone near the pantry, or out of the room, were only to be equalled by the remorse with which my mind dwelt on what my hands had done. Under the weight of my wicked secret, I pondered whether the church would be powerful enough to shield me from the vengeance of the terrible young man if I divulged to that establishment. I conceived the idea that the time when the bands were read and when the clergyman said, You are now to declare it would be the time for me to rise and propose a private conference in the vestry. I am far from being sure that I might not have astonished our small congregation by resorting to this extreme measure but for its being Christmas Day and no Sunday. Mr. Wopsle, the clerk at church, was to dine with us. And Mr. Hubble the wheelwright and Mrs. Hubble, and Uncle Pumblecook, Joe's uncle, but Mrs. Joe appropriated him, who was a well-to-do corn chandler in the nearest town, and drove his own chaise cart. The dinner hour was half past one. When Joe and I got home, we found the table laid, and Mrs. Joe dressed, and the dinner dressing, and the front door unlocked. It never was at any other time, for the company to enter by, and everything most splendid. And still, not a word of the robbery. The time came without bringing with it any relief to my feelings, and the company came. Mr. Wopsle, united to a Roman nose and a large shining bald forehead, had a deep voice which he was uncommonly proud of. Indeed, it was understood among his acquaintance that if you could only give him the church not being thrown open. He was, as I have said, our clerk. But he punished the amends tremendously, and when he gave out the psalm, always giving the whole verse, he looked all round the congregation first, as much as to say, You have heard my wopsle next to Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, and last of all to Uncle Pumblecook. And be he. I was not allowed to call him uncle under the severest penalties. Mrs. Joe said Uncle Pumblecook, 
a large, hard-breathing, middle-aged slow man, with a mouth like a fish, dull staring eyes, and sandy hair standing upright. Every Christmas day, Mrs. Joe replied, as she now replied, Oh, Uncle Pumble Chook, this is kind. Every Christmas day, he retorted, as he now retorted, And now are you all bobbish, and how sixpenorth of halfpence, meaning me. We dined on these occasions in the kitchen, and adjourned for the nuts and oranges and apples to the parlor, which was a change very like Joe's change from his working clothes to his Sunday dress. My sister was uncommonly lively on the present occasion, and indeed was generally more gracious in the society of Mrs. Hubble than in other company. I remember Mrs. Hubble as a little curly, sharp-edged person in sky blue, who held a conventionally juvenile position, because she had married Mr. Hubble, I don't know at what remote period, when she was much younger than he. I remember Mer Hubble as a tough, high-shouldered, stooping old man of a sawdusty fragrance, with his legs extraordinarily wide apart, so that in my short days I always saw among this good company I should have felt myself, even if I hadn't robbed the pantry, in a false position not because I was squeezed in at an acute angle of the table cloth, with the table in my chest, and the pumblecook in elbow in my eye, nor because I was not allowed to speak I didn't want to speak. No, I should not have minded that, if they would only have left me alone. But they wouldn't leave me alone. They seemed to think the opportunity lost, if they failed to point the conversation at me, every now and then, and stick the point into me. I might have been an unfortunate little bull in a Spanish arena. I got so smartingly touched up by these moral goads. It began the moment we sat down to dinner. Mr. Wopsle said grace with theatrical declamation, as it now appears to me, something like a religious cross of the ghost in Hamlet with Richard the Third, and ended with the very proper aspirate, upon which my sister fixed me with her eye, and said, in a low reproachful voice, Do you hear that? Be grateful. Especially, said Mr. Pumblecook, be grateful, boy, to them which brought you up by hand. Mrs. Hubble shook her head, and contemplating me with a mournful presentiment that I had come to no good, asked, Why is it that the young are never grateful? This moral mystery seemed too much for the company, and Hubble tersely solved it by saying, Naturally wishes. Everybody then murmured true, and looked at me in a particularly unpleasant and personal manner. Joe's station and influence were something feebler, if possible, when there was company than when there was none but he always aided and comforted me when he could in some way of his own, and he always did so at dinner-time by giving me gravy, if there were any. There being plenty of gravy to-day, Joe spooned into my plate, at this point, about half a pint. A little later on in the dinner, Mr. Wopsle reviewed the sermon with some severity, and intimated, in the usual hypothetical case of the church being thrown open, what kind of sermon he would have given them. After favoring them with some heads of that discourse, he remarked that he considered the subject of the day's homily ill-chosen, which was the less excusable. He added, You've hit it, sir. Plenty of subjects going about for them that know how to put salt upon their tails. That's what's wanted. A man needn't go far to find a subject if he's ready with his salt box. Mr. Pumblecook added, after a short interval of reflection, look at pork alone. There's a subject. If you want a subject, look at pork crew, sir. Many a moral for the young, returned Mr. Wopsle, and I knew he was going to lug me in before he said it, might be deduced from that text. You listen to this, said my sister to me, in a severe parent swine, pursued Mr. 
Wopsle, in his deepest voice, and pointing his fork at my blushes, as if he were mentioning my Christian name, swine were the companions of the prodigal. The gluttony of swine is put before us as an example to the young. I thought this pretty well in him who had been praising up the pork for being so plump and juicy. What is detestable in a pig is more detestable. Hubble. Of course, or girl, Mr. Hubble assented Mr. Wopsle, rather irritably, but there is no girl present. Besides, said Mr. Pumblecook, turning sharp on me, think what you've got to be grateful for. If you'd been born a squeaker. He was, if ever a child was, said my sister, most emphatically. Joe gave me some more gravy. Well, but I mean a four-footed squeaker, said Mr. Pumblecook. If you had been born such, would you have been here now? Not you, unless in that form, said Mr. Wopsle, nodding towards the dish. But I don't mean in that form, sir, returned Mr. Pumblecook, who had an objection to being interrupted. I mean, enjoying himself with his elders and betters, and improving himself with their conversation, and rolling in the lap. Would he have been doing that? No, he wouldn't. And what would have been your destination? Turning on me again. You would have been disposed of for so many shillings according to the market price of the article, and Dunstable the butcher would have come up to you as you lay in your straw, and he would have whipped you under his left arm. No bringing up by hand then. Not a bit of it. Joe offered me more gravy, which I was afraid to take. He was a world of trouble to you, ma'am, said Mrs. Hubble, commiserating my sister. Trouble. I chowed my sister. Trouble. And then entered on a fearful catalogue of all the illnesses I had been guilty of, and all the acts of sleeplessness I had committed. I think the Romans must have aggravated one another very much with their noses. Perhaps they became the restless people they were, in consequence. Anyhow, Mr. Wopsle's Roman nose so aggravated me, during the recital of my misdemeanors, that I should have liked to pull it until he howled. But all I had endured up to this time was nothing in comparison with the awful feelings that took possession of me when the pause was broken which ensued upon my sister's recital, and in which pause everybody. Yet, said Mr. Pumblecook, leading the company gently back to the theme from which they had strayed, pork regarded as biled, is rich too, ain't it? Have a little brandy, uncles. Oh, heavens, it had come at last. He would find it was weak. He would say it was weak, and I was lost. I held tight to the leg of the table under the cloth. With both hands, my sister went for the stone bottle, came back with the stone bottle, and poured his brandy out no one else taking any. The wretched man trifled with his glass, took it up, looked at it through the light, put it down, prolonged my misery. All this time, Mrs. Joe and Joe were briskly clearing the table for the pie and pudding. I couldn't keep my eyes off him. Always holding tight by the leg of the table with my hands and feet, I saw the miserable creature finger his glass playfully, take it up, smile, throw his head back, and drink the Instantly afterwards, the company were seized with unspeakable consternation, owing to his springing to his feet, turning round several times in an appalling spasmodic hooping cuff day. I held on tight, while Mrs. Joe and Joe ran to him. I didn't know how I had done it, but I had no doubt I had murdered him somehow. In my dreadful situation, it was a relief when he was brought back and surveying the company all round as if they had disagreed with him, sank down into his chair with the one significant I knew he would be worse by and by. I moved the table like a medium of the present day, by the vigor of my unseen hold upon it. Tar, cried my sister, in amazement. Why, however, could Tar come there? But Uncle Pumblecook, who was omnipotent in that kitchen, wouldn't hear the word, wouldn't hear of the subject, imperiously waved it all. My sister, who had begun to be alarmingly meditative, had to employ herself actively in getting the gin, the hot water, the sugar, and the lemon peel, 
and mixing. For the time being, at least, I was saved. I still held on to the leg of the table, but clutched it now with the fervor of gratitude. By degrees, I became calm enough to release my grasp and partake of pudding. Mr. Pumbler Cook partook of pudding. All partook of pudding. The course terminated, and Mr. Pumbler Cook had begun to beam under the genial influence of gin and water. I began to think I should get over the day when my sister said to Joe, clean plates, cold. I clutched the leg of the table again immediately and pressed it to me. I foresaw what was coming, and I felt that this time I really was gone. You must taste, said my sister, addressing the guests with her best grace you must taste, to finish with such a delightful and delicious present of Uncle Pumblecook's. My Uncle Pumblecook, sensible of having deserved well of his fellow creatures, said, quite vivaciously, all things considered, well, Mrs. Joe, we'll do our best endeavors. Let us have a cut at this same pie. My sister went out to get it. I heard her steps proceed to the pantry. I saw Mr. Pumbla Cook balance his knife. I saw reawakening appetite in the Roman nostrils of Mr. Wopsle. I heard Mr. Hubble remark that a bit of savory pork pie would lay atop of anything you could mention and do no harm, and I heard Joe say, shall have some, Pip. I have never been absolute. I felt that I could bear no more, and that I must run away. I released the leg of the table and ran for my life but I ran no farther than the house door, for there I ran head foremost into a party of soldiers with their muskets, one of whom held out a pair of handcuffs to me, saying, Here you are, and look sh The apparition of a file of soldiers ringing down the butt ends of their loaded muskets on our doorstep caused the dinner party to rise from table in confusion, and caused Mrs. Jory entering the kitchen empty-handed to stop short and stare, in her wondering lament of gracious goodness, gracious me, what's gone with the pie? The sergeant and I were in the kitchen. Joe stood staring, at which crisis I partially recovered the use of my senses. It was the sergeant who had spoken to me, and he was now looking round at the company, with his handcuffs invitingly extended towards them in his right hand, and his left on my shoulder. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, said the sergeant, but as I have mentioned at the door to this smart young chevre, which he hadn't, I am on a chase in the name of the king, and I... Mrs. returned the gallant sergeant, speaking for myself, I should reply, the honor and pleasure of his fine wife's acquaintance. Speaking for the king, I answer. Pumblecook cried audibly, good again, you see. Blacksmith, said the sergeant, who had by this time picked out Joe with his eye, we have had an accident with these, and I find, as they are wanted for immediate service, will you throw your eye over them? Joe threw his eye over them, and pronounced that the job would necessitate the lighting of his forge fire, and would, will it, will you set about it at once? Blacksmith, said the off-hand sergeant as it's on his majesty's service, and if my men can bear a hand anywhere, they'll make themselves useful. With that, he called to his men, who came trooping into the kitchen one after another, and piled their and then they stood about as soldiers do, now with their hands loosely clasped before them, now resting a knee or a shoulder, now even all these things I saw without then knowing that I saw them, for I was in an agony of apprehension but beginning to perceive that the handcuffs were not for me, and that the military had so far got the better of the pie as to put it in the background, I collected a little more of my scattered wits. Would you give me the time, said the sergeant, addressing himself to Mr. Pumblecook, as to a man whose appreciative powers justified the inference that he was equal to the time. 
It's just gone half past two. That's not so bad, said the sergeant, reflecting. Even if I was forced to halt here nigh to hours, that'll do. How far might you call yourselves from the marshes? Hereabouts, not above a mile, I reckon. Just a mile, said Mrs. Joe. That'll do. We begin to close in upon em about dusk. A little before dusk, my orders are. That'll do. Convicts, sergeant, asked Mr. Wopsle in a matter-of-course way.